to see how beautiful it is here, and your home should always be filled with bracha. I was joking with Mr. Mayor up here when I just when I got here. Thanks me for coming. I said, I said, that's the power. It's twin power. Twin power, because the, the host is a twin, my neighbor here is a twin, and I also have an identical twin brother. And he's coming, and oh, that, right, you're the twins to each other, right? Yeah, so when I, um, and he's going to be in town starting on Tuesday. <laughs> it's not true that you can't hear me, but now we all feel like it's a more important event. Okay, so, but my brother's going to be here in two days. So if you disagree with something I said, Make sure that when you see me starting Tuesday that you're yelling at me, okay, and that you're not yelling at him. Uh, last thing before I get to the, to the uh, real content of what I want to speak with you about is uh, when a speaker gets up, the speaker is always aware of what was just said about them during their introduction. And when you're aware, you can say, he said too much, he said too little, it's not true, I don't really have expertise about that, or whatever it is. You can thank the introducer for the gracious introduction, and you can just play along. But I have to tell you, I have absolutely no idea what Rabbi Baruch said. No idea. So if, if he said that I'm a nice guy, it, I think I hope it's true. If he said that I'm an expert about something, it's not true. If he said that I live in Scottsdale, that's true. Because that's just a fact. Okay, that's just a fact. If he said that we're longtime friends, that's also true. And hopefully I have something that I can share with you. Some of you I've had the opportunity to speak with before, but I really, I, I'm, I'm jealous of you that you have such a beautiful gathering together, such a beautiful, really, I'm, and it takes my breath away how beautiful, and I'm sure the Rabbanit is behind uh, much of the hard work to make it happen. And I'm sure there are many other people who are behind the hard work to make it happen. In fact, here as we speak, there are several restaurant uh, uh, proprietors, so you have to really, you gotta work hard to impress your community with food, I see. Okay? <laughs> but it looks like, but it looks like it's, it's happened. Um, it says in the Gemara that when a husband and a wife come together and they merit, zahu, they merit, shechina b'nehem, then the Shechina, the Hashem's presence, rests amongst them. Lo zachu, if they do not merit, esh uchlatam, fire consumes them. It means that marriage is a high risk, high reward environment. It means that there's a possibility of great things happening, and there's a possibility, chas v'shalom, of difficult things happening. It's not like any other friendship. It's not like a brotherhood, it's not like a sister, it's, it's nothing like anything else. Because it's the merging of one life. But if they merit, then Hashem's presence is amongst them. Why? Because the Hebrew word for man is ish. And the Hebrew word for woman is isha. This, each of those words contains only three letters. And in each of the words you have two common letters and one uncommon letter. The word Ish is spelled Aleph Yud Shin, and the word Isha is spelled Aleph Shin He. Aleph and Shin they have in common, but Yud in the man's word and He in the, in the, in the word for woman are uncommon. When they come together and he brings the Yud and she brings the He, then they have Yud He. Yud He is Hashem's name. Like Hallelujah, praise God. The word Ya, Yud He, is Hashem's name. So when they come together and they merit, Hashem is there. So much so that the Talmud says that when you celebrate a new chatan, a new kala, when you dance in front of them, it's as if you rebuilt Jerusalem. Because you rebuilt Hashem's presence in the world because you brought together a husband and wife and they're together and amazing things are happening. Hashem is there. God is there. If they don't merit, then the Aleph and the Shin are there no matter what. And Aleph and Shin spells Aish, spells fire. Disaster. So really what we're all here, if you came here tonight and you heard that I was going to speak about what happy couples know, then you came looking to merge the yud and the hay. You're not just like all the people in the world who are, you know, looking for some kind of happiness and they don't even know what happiness is. 
you're looking for a, a, a sense of Jewish togetherness that brings you and your spouse, you and your husband, you and your wife together, and then Hashem is there in your house. And when Hashem is there in your house, it's a different Shabbat. It's a different family. It's different children. And you have it right here for the taking. It's right in front of you. I'm sure many of you are already, thank God, very happy couples, and you could give the whole discussion. I want to tell you, before I left my house tonight, I have, the, I have a big schut in my life right now, a very, very happy thing, which is this coming Shabbat is my first, the first bar mitzvah of one of my sons. We're making bar mitzvah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hashem. And so, in, in my wife's eyes, there's nothing going on except for the bar mitzvah. She's right. There's nothing going on except the bar mitzvah. Except that two months ago, I told her, oh, I'm going to speak on November 12th, so there's something going on. So I reminded her that I'm speaking tonight, this morning, last night I reminded her, then tonight I said, I'm going out. She didn't even know what the topic was. I'm going out to speak to, uh, 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 to, to, to couples about shalom bayit, about happy, happy marriages. I did not tell her that the title of the talk is Three Secrets All Happy Couples Know. I did not say that to her at all. She said to me, tell them that there are three rules. <laughs> she said, tell them that there are three rules, and I mean it. She said, the three rules are for a happy marriage, stay in home. <laughs> That's what she told me to tell you tonight. <laughs> Stay in home. That's the whole story. <laughs> and now you trust me. I left my house and you're still trusting me to talk to you. It's unbelievable. By the way, it's not wrong. What she was really saying was that a husband needs to know the power of what it means to his wife when he just stays home. When he just stays, when he's just there. When he's just present. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So we are here to build our lives one-on-one -on -one me and my wife, me and my husband, together so that Hashem lives amongst us. And so that we keep the fire away from the, from the relationship. So as I said, I'm going to share with you three things. And, and after each one, we'll take a few minutes, if you want, for questions or arguments. Please don't throw anything. <laughs> I'm very nice. I'm happy to take any words you got, but no, no projectiles. Nothing in the air. The first thing that all happy couples know is that men and women are different. They need different things from marriage and, very important, and marriage is a workout room. It's a place where we go to grow and become. It is not a place where we go after we grew and we became and now we go like it is in the, all the movies. Where marriage is the end of, they, they, they worked it all out, and now they're getting married. That is sheker, that's a lie. Okay, I want to tell you something. The Hebrew word sheker has a shin, a kuf, and a resh. They all sit on one leg. They all have one leg at the bottom. Shin, kuf, and resh all have one leg. That's because it tips. Emet, the Hebrew word for, for, for truth, all has two legs, or a bottom. It sits very solid. Aleph, two legs, men, a big, long bottom. Top, two legs. So, if you, if you subscribe to Sheker, to lies, it's very tipsy. You fall over. If you subscribe to truth, then it stands on strong feet. The movies are filled with lies. In the movies, everybody is happy, and they get married, and they, quote, live happily ever after. Sheker, it's a lie. Yesterday in the Torah, yeah, yesterday in the Torah, we learned about the marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka. So there it said, that at the very end of the story, it said that Yitzchak took Rivka as his wife, and it says, he loved her. It does not say he loved her, and then he took her as the wife. It says, he, he took her as his wife, and he loved her. Which means that the love comes actually after, not before. It comes after from the hard work of being together. And marriage is a workout room where we grow as individuals. We improve as people every day of our lives in the context of our marriage. That's what makes it so different than any other relationship. Friendship is not someplace where you grow. 
Brotherhood is not someplace where you grow. Being someone's son, okay, sometimes that's someplace where you have to grow. Being someone's parent, you have to grow. But being someone's life partner, you are constantly tested to grow. And the problem, the challenge that people have is that they don't realize that men and women are different. Very different. Okay, I want to give you an example. Tonight, I want, when I go home, I want my wife to ask me how many people were there. Did they like what you said? What did you say? I want her to ask me those questions. Basically, I want her to make me feel important. Men want the, the woman in their life to make them feel important. <laughs> Here's what I mean by important. Men seek kavod. They seek honor. They really, the problem is they seek honor everywhere. They're always chasing honor. I want to tell you something. It says in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot that three things get in our way. Jealousy, running after lusts, and physical temptations, food and other more serious temptations. Okay? And honor. These three things, they're the source of all problems. The Maharal says that they're written in the order that they come in our lives to, take, to, to, to fight with us. When you're a little, little kid, you already feel jealousy. Then you become an adolescent, 13, 15, 16, 18, and it's all about physical things, pleasures. Then you become about 30, and for the rest of your life, the main thing is kavod. Among men. Okay? Men are bad. Yeah? Everybody gets that? Men are bad. Everybody knows that. Right? This is the ultimate sign that men are bad. Because men have to wear a kibah because they're bad. Women don't have to wear a kibah because they're not bad. Meaning guys forget that Hashem runs the world. Because they're concerned about their own running the world. So here's the thing. Men want kavod. You know where they want kavod the most? At home. I want my wife to feel I'm important. So I want to go home and I want my wife to feel I'm so happy you spoke to a big group of people and there were a lot of people there and they loved what you said, if they loved what you said, okay? I want her to feel that and, I, and if she comes to my speech, like I speak every Shabbat in, in, in our shul. If she comes, I want to hear from her. You spoke beautifully, you spoke well, that was something great. I, we all are looking for honor. That's what men want. Okay, now, so far we beat up on men. What do women want? Women want to be cared for. They want to feel, it's also important, but it's a different kind of important. They want to feel that this man will, is taking care of me, loves me. Okay, ladies, I want to ask you a question. What if in the morning when you went to go to take the bowl down for cereal, for yourself or for the kids, and your husband is already out of the house because he's already... Where does the man go in the morning? Shul. shul. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so he's already in shul. Or he's already at work. Whatever the case may be. He's out of the house. And you go and you take the cereal bowl out of the cupboard. And inside the cereal bowl, there's a little note. And it says, I may not be here right now, but I'm thinking about you wherever I am. Now, before you think that you don't want to be my wife, I never did it in my whole life, okay? I never did that. Okay, but... But it's a great idea. Shake it, shake it. Yeah, exactly. It's a great idea. A woman wants to receive a phone call in the middle of the day when she knows he's busy. That is not about a task. It's not about a job. It's not about a chore or an update. It's about, I'm thinking about you. I love you. You matter to me. <clears throat> Men and women are different. Totally different. You see, if I give a public speech, then I care about my presentation. But I don't care what my house looks like. I don't care if my house is a mess. It's a problem. Because my wife cares deeply if the house is a mess. My speech is my public presentation to the world. Her home is her public presentation to the world. So if I sit there and I don't care about the cleanliness of the home, what I'm really saying to her in her interpretation is, I don't care about you. Men and women are different. Men 
uh, spend the first 20 years of their life being men with men, hanging out with men, and then they get married, women the same, and you marry somebody different than you. And you have to expand yourself. By the way, they are going to do things that, for example, one person doesn't care if the dishes are done at night. Could be the man or the woman. Doesn't mind going to sleep if the dishes are dirty. The other one can't, cannot breathe. Why would anybody leave the dishes dirty so that tomorrow it's harder to clean them? <coughs> so guess what you have to do? You have to expand yourself to say, to realize that the other person is also right. You think Hashem is only one of these things? Hashem is just like me. That's what the, our problem really. We always think, God is just like me. And this other person I live with, that person's crazy. No, it's a lie. Okay, check it. That's what, that's what that is. We have to expand ourselves and grow and be bigger. Marriage is about being bigger. I want to tell you something. Lee and Hara. I have a big family. My wife blessed me. Hashem blessed me. We recently had a, a, a baby, a, a little girl. She's two months old. She's our, our, our eighth child, Lee and Hara. Baruch Hashem. Thank you. Thank you. And you should all be blessed the same this generation, many generations to come. Baruch Hashem. Amen. Amen. When a new child is born in our family, eventually we get a passport because we travel sometimes to Israel. We have family there, whatever it is. And every time we get the new passport, I put them all in the same pile. And then I look at them. And I take one, my passport, and I look at this one, and then I put it back in the pile and I look at them and say, it used to be just me. It used to be just me, now I have to take care of all these people. Marriage and having children is about expanding the me concept, who I am. I am not only me now, I am this person with whom I live, <coughs> this partner of mine, and I am the children. But by the way, the children, they eventually go away. If you're a successful parent, successful parents kick their children out of the house. Okay? And then they're still looking at the person sitting next to them. Bezrat Hashem. Okay? So you got to invest in that. you got to work on it. you got to work. So people know, secret number one is that men and women are different, and I'm prepared to work. I'm going to a workout room in order to work on myself, to expand myself, to grow and see the world beyond my own previous small way of seeing it, only my own way. Okay, any questions or arguments? This is your opportunity to speak. I have been taught that if I'm silent, somebody will speak. Well, how are you going to have problems? <laughs> they don't have problems with speaking or they don't have problems with marriage? For kavod, you have to work. You have to work, then you get kavod. Yes. How you get the by the way, by the way, I want to tell you something. I'm glad you said that. Mm -hmm. You see, women instinctively know what men want. Women are very happy to invest in their marriage. Mm -hmm. What they want to invest in their marriage is the feeling that he's that he loves me. I'll, I'll give you an example. If in your family, if if in your family, generally the woman of the house, let's say, does the dishes. Let's just say that, if that's how it's structured in your life. If the man does the dishes once, not forever, <laughs> I don't know what the multiplier is, I don't know what, every family's going to be a little different, but I would say, easily she will happily do five or six times. Easily. If he does once, easily five or six, maybe ten or twenty or thirty. In other words, he shows that he cares, that he's willing to shoulder the burden together with her, that he'll carry some of the weight. She'll carry almost all the weight. Just so he shows he's willing to show up. Well. Say again? She does. Oh, beautiful point. He bought her a dishwasher. Let's listen to this. She only wants one dishwasher in the world. And that's you. <laughs> that's the problem. This happens in my house all the time. Today, today, tomorrow, my wife says, I, like, I have to help my son. I have to help my son with his speech for Shabbat. I'm the only person in the world who can help. 
I really am, because it's my job. Anybody in the world could, could schlep in the, the, the groceries. She wants me to show that I want to schlep in the groceries. I want to carry on we're together with the family. I, she wants me to show that I care, that I'm there, that I'm willing to, 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 to be together. And women, this is the, it, it's, like it, it's like an unfair advantage that men have, because the women want the marriage to be great. They're intrinsically relationship-oriented more than the men, usually. So if the guy does a little bit, a little bit of his part, oh, uh, then she's already. Now it's, it's true. It's not me, is it? No. So it's a point you're making about you know how things divide. Every family's different, but wherever the dividing lines are, if you do for your wife, she's going to shower you with doing for you ten times more, I'm sure at least. Okay, I'm going to go on to the second. I'm going to go on to the oh, second scene. You call me. You tell me if it doesn't work. Uh, it's going to work. Okay, you try it. Okay. Now, there's a funny statement in the Talmud in the Gemara. It says in the Gemara, I think it's, it's Masachet Rachot. It says that in Babel, in the country of Babylonia where the, where the Talmud was written, they used to ask a Chatan a short time after he was married, a groom a short time after he was married, they asked him, Matza o Motze? Matzah means he found. Motze means he is finding. Matzah or Motze. That was their code way of saying, how's married life treating you? Now why? Because one pasuk, one verse says, Matzah isha, Matzah telefo. He found a wife. He found good. He found good. So they say, Matzah, did you find? Is it good? Motze is in Kohelet, it says, Motze ani mar mimavet et haisha. I find more bitter than death the wife. That's not good. That's not good. So one place it says, I found a wife, I found good. The other one says, I find her currently more bitter than death. So that was the way, they're just two guys hanging out together. And the guy asks, hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, my son was here. You know, is it good or is it worse than death? So, I have a question. Why is it that in past tense, it's good, but in present tense, it's worse than death? Past tense, it's good. In present tense, it's no good. And which, if I have past and I have present, what is missing to complete the set? Future. future. So is there another verse that's about future regarding a wife? The answer is yes. Most famous pasuk in all of Tanakh regarding a wife. Most famous pasuk. Eishet chayel mi imsa. Rachot mi pinim michra. A woman of valor who will find, she's more, her value is more precious than rubies. <coughs> will find, yimsa. So now I have a whole set. I have matzah, past tense, good. Motze, present tense, no good. Yimsa, in the future, who will find a woman of valor? Good. Great. She's great. What is the secret of why in the past it's bad and in the future it's bad? It, excuse me. Past is good, future is good, present is bad. So I'm going to tell you a secret. This is some secret number two. In every marriage, the problem is the present. The problem is right now. Here's what I mean. We share a past. We got to know each other. We built things. Let's say I'm having an argument with my wife. We are Baruch Hashem married 19 years almost. We have a big family together. We have been through many, many great things, many challenging things, and yet we've been there together through the challenging things. We've had ups and downs in our own relationship. We've had ups and downs with some of the kids. We built things together in, in terms of, let's say, my role as the rabbi and her role together with me there. We've done a lot of things that we lived in, in multiple houses. We bought houses. We had cars. We brought children into the world. We have a huge past already in 19 years. Baruch Hashem. It's good. There's a reason why we got together. 
I saw in her something, she saw in me something, we saw shared values, we saw good times, we saw chemistry, the past is good. Now we're having an argument. In the argument, you really say, it's all bad, it's terrible. By the way, I want to tell you something, everybody makes this mistake in marriage, you have to do your best to get rid of it. Everybody makes the mistake of using the words always and never. Okay? You always do that. When I, when I say something like that, you always respond like that. You never do what I want you to do in that situation. Okay, that's the biggest lie out there. Always and never are total lies. Those are lies. Those are fictions we tell each other. It's so ridiculous. If you would catch yourself in the lie, you'd say, what a silly thing I'm saying. You, you never... You never have the, the, the you're, you're never on time. That's not true. He, he is on time sometimes. She is on time sometimes. That's not true. That's, that's a lie. What's that? You went for the wedding shoe with me. <laughs> Always and never try, try in speaking to your spouse to avoid using those words. They're ugly words. They're ugly words. So, the problem is right now. The future is bright. The future is worth it. We have to get through the now without throwing it like, tomorrow and every day after is going to be terrible. It's not true. You see, you dream big dreams together. I can tell you about me. I dream, Bezrat Hashem, to be with my wife, holding hands when I see my grandchildren walking to the chuppah. Bezrat Hashem. That's what I do. And I bless you, you should see the same thing, all of you. You know you want that. So get through the present with a little bit of calm. Take it easy. Take it easy. The problem is right now, okay, we have a problem. We have an impasse. We're not agreeing about something. Be a man. Speak nicely. It's worth it. It's worth it for everything from the past. It's worth it for everything in the future. And the truth is, it's almost always, the past is good. As you climb the inside, the future is good. And the, the language of the pasuk is talking to the man about the woman, but it's all the same. It doesn't matter. It's talking the same thing to the woman, to the man. That's just how it's written. It doesn't. Don't, don't, don't get lost in that. Secret number two is that the present is the problem. So calmly get through the present. Don't ruin tomorrow because of this moment right now. It's a, it's a mistake that people make to think that today, this moment, is so big. Yesterday's great. Tomorrow is great. Just calmly get through this moment. That's the only problem right now. Okay, questions or arguments? Come on, friends. You know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get... You pull out the short. No. <laughs> That's, like you're already putting your own problems in there. You know what I'm really going to get? What I'm gonna, I will. My wife is wonderful. She's going to tell me, I hope one great, good, I hope, I hope, you know, and she'll tell me someday, because some, some of you will see her, you'll say, she'll say, I heard you spoke beautifully, whatever it is. But she's also going to say to me, are we meeting tomorrow at 9.30 so we can talk about the, the orders for the bar mitzvah? You know, can you be here when the landscaper is coming? Can you be here when the, this is coming? Because she wants me to care. She wants me to do what she needs to have done. Okay, but we'll get through this present also. I have a very bright future. The week before the bar mitzvah is a tough present. We're going to get there. That's right. That's right. How do I manage that? Very long. Sometimes you can't be there because of not time. I don't think I'm an expert about it. Let me tell you something. I'm challenged. No, no, no. I, 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 yes. I, 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 for me, it's a problem. I, I don't think I do a good job. Okay. Tonight I'm going to stay up very, very, very late because I have not managed my time well to help my son with his bar mitzvah speech. And I cannot, till tomorrow, still don't have a firm. I can't. So I, that's a big challenge for me. But if I could give you some advice about it, I would say like this. First of all, first of all, there are many great books about the topic. Okay, secular books. Many great books. If, 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 I'm going to tell you the name of an author. He'll help you a lot. His name is Stephen Covey. Okay, Stephen Covey, you know that name? Yeah, Stephen Covey has written, he's now passed away a couple of years ago. He wrote beautifully about the topic of time management and about priorities. He, he wrote his, the thrust of his works are that people in our generation run really, really, really fast. They know how to climb the ladder. They just don't know which building the ladder should be leaning against. 
Okay? So they're always running up the ladder, but they don't know which lane which one. So, so that's one thing I would say, one piece of advice. But another piece of advice, and this is a big thing, big. This is like a whole separate lecture. If you really know well what's important to you, what you think is the right thing, and hopefully you're right, you're listening to Hashem, you're listening to your teachers, you're listening to your wife, whatever it is, but you know what the right thing is, then you can't get dragged in by other people to do the things they think you ought to do. Okay? And a lot of what we have problems with is that I have to impress somebody else with what that person thinks I need to do. But I have learned this in my, in my people are always mad at me. I want to tell you something. Shul rabbi, people are always mad at you. Okay? That's part of the job. You could ask these rabbis here. If you're mad at the rabbi right now, I got news for you. If you came to my shul, you'd be mad at me too. Okay? That's what people are. They're mad at the rabbi. Okay? Now, that's my experience. <laughs> maybe it's not true. Maybe it's just me. No, I tell you. People are always mad at the rabbi. Why? Because they want the thing to be exactly as. The rabbi has to know what he thinks is supposed to happen, and then he has to, has to try his best. You know, he has to try his best. So the same thing in all of our lives, if we get dragged by other people's needs for us, we're going to get killed. But I didn't really answer your question. It is a very tough thing in this day and age, how we handle all that stuff. Okay? You won't be making a mistake if you invest in your wife and your kids. I'll tell you that. I promise you that. You will not be making a mistake in that. That's for sure. Because in the end, that's all you got. Okay? In the end, that's really all you got. And the next world. You've got to invest in your relation with Hashem. You know, but that's but it's a big topic you brought up. It's a hard one. Okay, let's go on to secret number three. Every happy couple knows this, but I'm going to tell you something that nobody ever talks about. Okay, hopefully the rabbis will not be upset with me. Nobody ever talks about this, but I'm going to put it right on the table right now. Every happy couple knows that a happy relationship includes both physical closeness and non-physical closeness. That it involves both a sense of love and, and positive elements in the physical contact between the husband and the wife and in the non-physical contact. Let me, see what, let me tell you what I mean. The Gemara says in Masech Nida that the master of the universe was a genius. And he knows the nature of people. And he knows that, you know, if you have some food here you love, some delicious food, you know, like, maybe you like uh, fluff. <laughs> yeah, if I give you something that you love that's delicious, and I give it to you for breakfast, and for lunch and for dinner. And the next day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. And the next day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. At, at some point, you would never want to see it again. I want to throw up. Get it away from me. <laughs> it was my favorite, and now I can't stand it. Like, if you ever overplay a song, if you like a certain song and you overplay it, you can't listen to it for the next, like, 10 or 12 years. Okay? <laughs> okay? Enough is enough. So, the, so Hashem knew that there's magic. There's magic in following the laws of the mikvah. Magic. And the magic is that the husband and wife are interested in each other like the night they got married, if they follow the rules. When they come back together, they're interested in each other like the night they got married. Okay, like I said, nobody's ever talking about this. I'm talking about it. Healthy, happy marriages include a good exciting physical closeness. And they also include meaningful, loving, warm closeness that has nothing to do with physicality. And that's the magic of the schedule of the laws of Tarat HaMishpacha. Magic. Because they have to relate to each other with physical closeness and they have to relate to each other with no physical closeness. And then magic is possible between them. And every person needs this. Even the man needs closeness that is not physical. Certainly his wife needs closeness that's not physical. And even the woman needs closeness that's physical. Both absolutely, absolutely need to be worked out. By the way, if a couple has a challenge in this area, 
it will be a challenge to their marriage, to their closeness. Doesn't have to be, but don't be afraid to seek help from somebody who can help you if you have a challenge there. Because Hashem made a world where I want to tell you as a related thing. I don't know if you if people here are you have children who are getting married. Okay, if you have children getting married or friends who are not yet married, I really believe in short engagements. Okay, that when somebody becomes engaged, get married quickly. Okay, you know why? I'll tell you why I believe in, in, in short engagements. The emotional connection is already established. We're like, we're meant for each other. We're one thing, but you're not one thing. You don't live together. You don't live together physically. You're not, you're not one thing. So Hashem made a bunch of ingredients. Included in them is elements of living together in every way. And that's what makes for close bonding. And then I think it's particularly challenging on a woman, <clears throat> on a young woman who's engaged, particularly challenging. She says, oh, he's Prince Charming. We're supposed to already feel totally bonded. And then we don't feel totally bonded. Because I could tell you, you're not going to. You're not going to because you don't have all of the ingredients. And when you don't have all the ingredients, there's challenges. It doesn't mean a marriage has to be unhappy forever. But it means that it is... See, happy couples know that... Both sides of this are crucial. Crucial to making the marriage the best it can be. And the reason I dare to say it to you is that I went to a seminar for rabbis only, and a famous Hasidic rabbi got up and he said, talked about the ingredients of a happy marriage, and he put this right on the table. I said, Rabbi, good for you. I'm proud of you. I'm going to do it also. I'm going to tell people that this is what the couples need together. Okay, that was the most... Daring of the parts of what we said, but this is important as well to making for the happiest marriages. So let's review. The first thing I told you was that when a marriage is happy, Hashem is there. He brings the Yud, Ish, she brings the He, Isha. By the way, sides, just a side point. Yud and He are the letters with which, with, with which the world was created. Rashi tells us in the Chumash, that Yud created the next world and He created this world. That means that the husband and wife, when they come together with their Yud and the He, they're bringing together the whole world, its potential, the whole world. Which means the spiritual world and the physical world all coming together. Spiritual and physically. They, 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 they have a, a house with bricks and mortar, they have food and an oven, and they have a bathroom, and they have everything that's physical, and they have spiritual togetherness and bonding, and Shabbat, and the table, and the way they speak to each other, and the growth they have. The whole world is coming together. The next world and this world together. It's big. This is a big deal. It's like you're rebuilding Jerusalem. And that's why you came here. And bless you. Because you came here to try to do even better. Even better. You're, if you're here, it's not because you're trying to solve a problem. It's because you're trying to be even better. So how do we be, get even better? Number one, we spoke about the idea that men and women are different. Principally, men want you to give them honor. Women want you to give them love. Guys, the more love you'll give, I promise you, you'll be paid back ten times. This is just easy. It's just it's just the best bet you'll ever make in your life. That, in fact, to a great degree, the power of a good marriage depends on the man. It's in his hands. Because the more he does for his wife, she's just going to anyway, she loves her husband, she wants to give to her husband. I know I'm making it unfair to the guys, but that's life. I can say it because I'm a guy too. It never happened. Huh? Okay. <laughs> no, it's not true. Your, your wife is very happy. She's been smiling the whole time. <laughs> I guess what he's trying to say, how do you do it? <laughs> Stay being home. That's it. Small stuff. It really is. It's, it's, it's small stuff. It's in small stuff. It's, it's when you walk into the house. I don't know. It's when you walk into the house, and it's a little bit crazy there. And if you want to do it all wrong, you say... I'm going to sit down and have something to eat. And if you want to do it all right, you see the situation, and you walk over to your wife, and you take the two-year-old and say, I'm going to get him ready for bed. It seems to me that this is universal. But... I do not know your world. I don't know. You will know. Okay, that's, so that's, that was secret number one. Men and women are different. We work to grow in marriage. We improve ourselves. And 
Women also, you can improve yourself asking your husband, being proud of him, making him feel important. You make him feel important, he's going to make give you love that you're looking for. But no, very, no clearly that men and women are different. You, it's not like your buddy. It's not like your friend. You know, it's not the same. By the way, I didn't say this before, sometimes women also want you to just listen. They're not looking for a solution. Okay? Attention. Just listen. Yeah, attention. Attention, attention equals love, which means that when you're being told a story that you're ready to say, yeah, well, the answer is, it's not about the answer. It's about the hearing. All the time is the right time to listen. Then you can say always. Now that's how you can say always. <laughs> okay, number two was that the, pro the present is the problem. The future and the past are bright. So push through the present, see the beauty of the, of the future, know the beauty of the past, and work together to get through the present, and it's going to be beautiful. And the third part was that the, the rhythm of the, of the laws of, of, of family purity and the use of the mikvah is an example in life, but, the, but it's true even no matter what's going on in your family life in that, that physical closeness is important and also expressions of love that are not physical are important. They both are crucial to, a, to the happiest marriage that you can have. Okay, I'm done with what I have to say. Does anybody have any other questions or arguments before we... Turn off the microphone. Can you go and shut the last thing you said? I don't think. Uh, what do you? I mean, <laughs> can you go up with the example? Okay, let me give you an example of. Let me give you an example of non-physical intimacy. Okay, non-physical intimacy is is asking your wife how her day was. It's being close and present, even though there is not going to be any kind of physical contact. It's flowers and cards. Cards! Oh my God, the power of cards. I'm telling you, cards. Cards are incredibly powerful. Which card are you talking about? Credit card? <laughs> like this. I really mean this. Let's say you get a gift card. Okay? Let's say you get a gift card. So when you get a gift card, it usually comes in like this one folded thing or just it's one page, right? Get a card, and they have one line there. Never use that line. Put the gift card in an envelope. Get another card that goes over it. Write a note. The note is as important as the gift card. And even in Bukharian community, it doesn't matter. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll give you back. They're going to say it's not enough. Give me another card. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about it. You're going to win. You're going to win. I'm telling you, the card is more important. The card is more important than the flowers. It's more important than anything. By the way, a perfect example. I want to say something. The best thing of an example of what I just said is a card that has no gift. <laughs> I'm telling you, not always. I don't care. I'm telling you, I know you're laughing at me. You're saying she's going to be looking behind the card. Right now, I'm telling you, you write a card to your wife that is just about, you know, I want to tell you something. We just had, like I said, Baruch Hashem, we had another child. And I wrote my wife a, a very meaningful card on the, when the day she came back from the hospital. Okay? I, I did not buy her a gift. I should have bought her a gift, and I want to buy her a gift. Okay, I didn't buy a gift so far. Okay, but I wrote her a very meaningful card, and it wasn't long at all. I don't want to say exactly what it was. It wasn't long, but it was very meaningful. And what accompanied it was only ten. I I, 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 I bought a dozen roses, and I threw out two of them. Okay, I, I, I threw out two of them because I wanted specifically to use ten flowers because we now are a family of ten people. Okay, and I wrote a card about the number 10. And it's, it's, worth more than the, it's worth more than gold, I'm telling you. It's worth more than gold, I'm telling you. I, trust me. I think the other side of it is self-explanatory, right? Okay, fine. Good. Okay, folks, I'm going to wrap up now. I hope that I, I gave you something to think about. I want you to be in touch with me if I can help you in some way. 
Okay? And I, and, I, and I want to, next time, whatever the next time is, I'm happy to come back. December you know, whatever 3rd. I fit into the schedule. December 3rd. December 3rd. That's my schedule already? You want me to come back? Sure, sure. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there is a smart man. I'm not making a commitment until I speak to my wife about it. Okay, but I look forward to being with you again, Bezrat Hashem. And again, thank you to the host. Thank you wherever the hosts are. I don't see you now. Thank you so much for, for hosting. And listen, another last thing. Last thing, friends. You have good friends. You can, your friends can help you in every part of your life. And you have good teachers. You know, I'm, I, it's easy to be me. I come in here, I shoot my bullets, and I'm out of here. I go back, and then everybody at my show is mad at me, like I said. <laughs> so... The thing is that you should trust in your teachers and your rabbis and, their, and the, and the, and the uh, there's no good Hebrew, like, like we say Rebbe since it's an easier word to deal with than Rabbaniyot, you know what I mean, or whatever the right word would be. But, uh, what's that? Rabbaniyot. Yeah. So you have great people here and, and you should rely upon each other and, and together you're going to grow into beautiful families. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.